You're listening to Wrestling to the Max. Alert, alert, clear all channels. This is an exclusive pay per view review. How you like that? And your host, Gary Vaughn, Sean Garmer, and Paul Deezer. King of Spot. New Japan Pro Wrestling. That still has to be one of the best themes New Japan has ever made. But yes, we are talking New Japan vs. Super Juniors, the final, here on this WTM special. Gary, take it away. That's right, we are definitely talking about that final Best of Super Juniors. We're excited about talking about it. Plus, also, we're going to talk about some of that G1 stuff coming up to you, the G1 Climax I'm talking about. We'll be getting into that somewhere in between, and some news. We'll be talking a few things in the news world that we want to get into. Uh, And just to let you guys know, this is, of course, a New Japan special, so this is not going to include any other promotions or anything like this. This is just for New Japan. Uh, We'll get into some news on the other wrestling uh, promotions, but really this is specific for that. We're excited about doing it for you guys. We love doing these specials because, you know, it gets us a chance to really deep down delve into some of these interesting pay-per-views, interesting uh, moments in wrestling that we can't on a normal show. Because on a normal show, my God, we cover like six promotions, you would think at least. Uh, (laughs) There's a lot of stuff we cover on a normal show. And if you want to go check out a normal show, if you're a first-time listener and you never listen to Wrestling to the Max, we do our show every Thursday night, Friday morning. Come check us out. Hey, live on, or on demand, either way. Uh, but this is, of course, something that if you're listening to, you're probably a New Japan fan, or maybe you're just a first-time listener wanting to hear what we're all about. So come check us out then. And, of course, we have a big show for you guys today. Uh, Paul, man, it, it, I know you're a, a big into this. You're actually kind of the reason we do New Japan now because before we, we, we knew about it, we didn't watch it a whole lot. Uh, how excited were you about this tournament this year? I, I was fairly excited. Uh, I mean, other than me and Sean, uh, well, Sean pretty much predicted the final. I was I was off by a person, but you know, it, it's it's uh, it was a good time. I think uh, it was. I, I'd say it was better than last year's personally. That's um, good. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I've only I didn't get you know the only thing I've watched from last year is the stuff they showed on that Axis show, which is the two final match, the two semifinal and the final match or whatever, which uh, leads into this year's, which is great because last year was Prince Puma Ricochet winning it and Kushida losing. And then this year you have what you have. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That see, man, Sean. I I wish I would have watched that one. Now I may have to go look up that footage and find that match because I did not re- realize Ricochet was the guy that was facing Koshida last year in the final. Um, I just can't imagine how good that match was. <laughs> uh, this one this year is pretty good, but we'll get into that. I don't want to give away too much, but um, definitely great stuff. I, I'm really kind of curious to see, you know. Uh, when I get a chance to watch the entire tournament this year, I didn't get a chance to watch the entire tournament. I did watch the final. I know, Sean, you did watch the tournament. I know, Paul, he's been trying to keep up with it. Busy, busy man right there, Paul. Uh, So he's been doing that as we get here. But we all got a chance to check out this final. Really looking forward to talking about it. So why don't we go ahead and get into it, guys? Let's go ahead and jump into the Super Juniors uh, and really, you know, get into all that is it is. So, okay, let's hit that music. Take it away, Paul. All right. Uh, well, as much as I would love to skip to the main event because there's not a lot of great stuff to talk about on the undercard, <laughs> uh, we were going to talk about the undercard. <laughs> uh, so we opened the show. Uh, Ryusuke Taiguchi teams up with Yohei Komatsu to take on Jushin Thunder Liger and Sho Tanaka. 
Uh, I thought this was a fair opener. Uh, I really dug sort of how, like, if you have New Japan World or if you've been paying attention to the tournament or just New Japan, I think, since January, uh, you've got to watch Komatsu and Tanaka come up from, and Jay White to a certain extent, too, when they decide to use them, come up from really green-looking guys to, I think, Yohei is just waiting to break out and show Tanaka isn't too far behind him. Uh, Taiguchi does end up putting Tanaka away uh, for the victory for his team, but I, I tell you what, they made Sho Tanaka and Kamatsu look really good in this match, in my opinion. Yeah, Tanaka wasn't part of the tournament, so they kind of tried to let him have a bunch of shine here, which is totally fine, and Kamatsu is... Man, uh, he's one of those that definitely he helped himself a lot in this tournament. I think uh, the other guy would be Beretta for me, but he... Just, I, I think he shows that he's definitely really close to coming out of that young lion spot. And I mean, he didn't, he didn't get a point, but every match he was in it, every match he, he brought something. And then this one was no different. I mean, I, I hate to say things about Taguchi because I'd be here all day just being <laughs> negative. But just, I'm sorry, the ass offense just bothers me, but. It is what it is, I guess, because he, you know, he never used to, he apparently never really had a lot of uh, charisma, so this is kind of like his way of having an act and a gimmick, and it is what it is. It's just, you know, you can only take so much ass. Yeah, I agree, Sean, because that, that's the one thing I noticed in this match. I mean, every time you turn around, he's like, here it is. Oh, here it is some more. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm going to do the Rikishi in your face. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it no, was a little bit. He puts Rikishi to shame, Gary. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about that. His rear end isn't that big, and he wears more clothing. Rikishi wore, so I, I know, but I don't think Rikishi <laughs> used his butt as much as Taguchi does. <laughs> that is true. I have to agree with that. You know, um, so you know, he actually it, didn't win with a ass attack, which is weird because that's mm-hmm. all he was doing in the tournament. Yeah. Oh, really? So that's pretty much his his whole thing in the like, tournament. Yeah, his his finisher in the tournament a lot of the times was like a sliding butt attack, <laughs> and it was so freaking messed up because the Dodon is actually a cool finisher, you know, mm-hmm. um, the one he used to win this match, and it's like really you're gonna lose so, use something so basic to win, you know, just. <laughs> Yeah, it is kind of interesting that they chose the you know to do that, but I, I just think that you know overall this was a decent match. Um, I wouldn't say it was the best thing to start the show. You know, I always kind of gauge shows sometimes, and, and this is New Japan. I, I don't think I can really look too much into that, um, but I usually expect a big match at the beginning to get the crowd going. But I don't really think the Japanese fans. Now, you know, Paul, correct me, but do the Japanese really, really need a big match to start their shows? I think they kind of respect them. You know, I don't know. It, the process of card position is much different. Over here in the States, uh, Canada, uh, and Europe, I would say, too, the opener is just as coveted, I think, as the main event. In Japan, it's very much the opposite. The, you're, you, when you're buying your tickets to shows, you know what the full card is and where every, sh- every match on the show is going to be. So when, uh, when people were looking up the show to buy tickets, they had... You know, you see the card is Taiguchi and Kamatsu opening with Liger and Tanaka, and then you go all the way down to your main event, which wasn't known until the end of the tournament, obviously. But you knew it was going to be the finals; it was going to be the main event. So, uh, cur- curtain jerking, opening, whatever you want to call it, um, usually reserved for either lower tiers guys like Kamatsu or Tanaka, or guy, or in this case, they're paired up with two veterans. But it's uh, it's not so much about trying to start the show off hot; it's much more about card positioning and, and yeah these guys are trying to put on a show but it's also about this is where these guys are right now you know mm-hmm. so basically that you, like you're saying that it's about position where you are the higher the card is that you are on or the higher you are on the card it's kind of like what level you're at and not so much you know eh, you know you're a good work worker you it, know exact for the for the most part when like when you look at dominion or when you look at um uh the Tokyo Dome show or sort of just their bigger pay-per-view, like, you know, we'll do King of pro wrestling. We'll see later on in the year too. It's sort of, it gets a little wishy-washy there sometimes, but usually you'll always have your, like your young lions or your openers um, or multi-mans as has been often the case this year with junior heavyweights uh, in the opening spot. Fair enough. Yeah, like, you know, you, that's what's so cool about dominion is that they normally never have like six singles matches in one 
you know, like, big show. It's always what you get, like, what you get with this show, where it's, like, you know, tags and multi-man tags and whatever that, you know, what, like, obviously Dominion's one of their bigger shows, but it's, like, cool to see something more of akin to what you would get, like, in a, you know, pay that we watch all the time, where you have these big singles matches with, with big, uh, st- with storylines going through them instead of just guys thrown into this multi-man tag that at the end of the day really doesn't mean a whole lot mm-hmm. you know okay that's very interesting yeah and also say what you will about the butt offense but it led to a badass german suplex from show to knock oh it. i agree that him <laughs> catching the butt offense to the deadlift german was cool yeah. i did yeah i see and the crowd popped majorly for that i love the way the crowd reacted yeah i they've really got behind these young line guys which is something nice to see uh but we're going to move on now. Next match, second match on the card. Tiger Mask uh, takes on Chase Owens. Uh, solid, nothing bad, but just nothing great and very boring, in my opinion. It, it was interesting yeah. to me about this is the fact that the way Chase Owens just jumped on Tiger Mask. I mean, mm-hmm. just right. I mean, we've seen this plenty of times, but it's the point of it is, is I, I mean, I, I, anybody listening right now, I am still learning more and more about New Japan. That's why I'm asking maybe questions. If you're a regular, if you're like Paul, maybe even like Sean, that you've watched lots of New Japan, you have to understand I haven't, so I'm learning as I go. Um, and so I didn't think they really did a whole lot of that kind of stuff in the Japanese wrestling with all the respect that they have, you know. But I love the fact that Chase Owens jumps on him. I think he knows, you know, where he's at. He played it really aggressive in this match. Uh, and in the end, Tiger Mask was able to overcome. But I just thought that was really cool to see Chase Owens just get on him right away. Didn't even let the bell ring. So it's it was good, but like you said, Paul, not the greatest match. Yeah, it was kind of bland. Um, him going for the mask constantly and, you know, it didn't seem like the crowd was really responding that much to it. And, eh. It it is what it is, you know. Tiger Mask is kind of known for just kind of being his his mediocre self, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, and uh, let's face it, Chase Owens is no miracle worker either. I mean, he's a fair <laughs> yeah. guy, but I don't think he's anything overly special. Uh, yeah, Tiger, I uh, uh, I'll, he's his age is starting to show. He's no he's no liger. I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. apparently Chase Owens has actually. Apparently, really good matches in NWA, but when he comes to New Japan, it, it doesn't turn out that well. Except for, I think his second match with Liger was apparently really good. It was all right. Again, it's also Liger. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what? It seems to me when a guys you know are very aggressive like that, they do try to hide some of their you know the things that they can't do. Honestly, um, so. I don't know. I haven't seen the rest of those guys, you know, the Chase Owens matches, but that's what it seemed like to me. And speaking of uh, Liger, if you want to, you know, we were talking about Kamatsu earlier. If you want to watch something that proves that even though Liger is 50, he still brings it, watch the first match of the first day of the tournament, Kamatsu against Liger, still one of the better matches of the entire thing. Yeah, I, and even then, Liger's run, I think, in the last uh, the last co-promoted shows with Ring of Honor this year were, were pretty darn good, too. Um, mm-hmm. overly as far as the whole product goes. Uh, but Tiger Mask does get the win here. He makes Owens tap out. Uh, Owens goes to attack Tiger Mask after the match, and Jay White sort of stops him. So I'm assuming that is going to be a thing uh, that we'll see later on. Uh, third match, Mascara Dorada takes on Barbero Cavanaro. Um, Lucha Fun, I really loved this match a lot. I think, uh, I think Larry Ser- sort of old undersold it in his review on 411 because I thought these two worked one heck of a match outside of the last botch. Oh, the finish yeah. just... Yeah. <laughs> oh, that finish. I felt so bad for them because it was so, so good. And then it's just like, dud right there at the end. It's yep. Like, oh. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a firecracker. You know, you see you're getting excited. It's so cool. You know, the sparks and you're just waiting and then it fizzles out. No, it was. it's just so like... They, they're they just, both of them are really good. I thought Cavanadio was another one that had a really, uh, just from the beginning with the whole, the referee grabbing the club and he, he like can't hold it, you know? <laughs> 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 and then uh, Cavanadio puts the thing on him and he's like, oh my God, why are you putting this on me? You know, just like, 
just that stuff it's just it's great and then you know they obviously know each other from being in the same company and it's just just wonderful stuff constantly um dorado is just fantastic it's so uh, it's really crappy because like dorado just makes everything look so simple every time he does it you know mm. just he he wows you every time he does something and then it's just like oh man the one time he messes up you know mm-hmm it, you know what? And I equated this match to like a tornado. And the reason being is because both these guys were just going all over the place, in and out of the ring, uh, even in the ring. They were spinning. It was just, it was nuts. But it was great. It was uh, uh, just a lot of fun to watch overall. You didn't want to turn your eyes away from it. Yeah. It's just like you guys said. The end was kind of a letdown. But you know, to me personally, even with the end, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I, I think a lot of people, you know, who enjoy, you know, matches like these, especially Lucha Libre, will love it. Uh, I, I just want to clear this up for myself. So this whole gimmick with uh, Cavanara, um, that so he's supposed to be like a Mexican caveman. Uh, what's up yes. with that? Yes, it's just, I, I just never heard of that. I love, it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's just so funny to me. I, I love the music and all that, and I kind of felt bad for him because if he's a Mexican caveman, does he know what sopapillas are? I hope so. <laughs> They're delicious. <laughs> I, I just wondered about that. Like, poor man, he's never had a Sophia. Anyway. We're also yeah, talking he... about somebody, Gary, who you watch Lucha Underground every week, and uh, a Mexican wrestling caveman is the one that shocks you is, is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is true. <laughs> that is true. He's he would crazy. fit right in with Lucha Underground, though. It's oh, so yeah. true. Yeah, he would. I, I think he'd be great. Yeah, because it's like, you know, he just... He seems like that kind of character, you know, just like you wouldn't see him at this kind of show, but it just he's he's really, really good. I um, people make a big deal about his flash of the floor and I don't know why they do. He never hits on his knees. He's he hits on his stomach, which is actually pretty amazing if you think about it to fall from that far. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the one thing I think I learned from this match is that New Japan finally learned how to use replay. Because yep. I think they did more replay in this match than they ever have. Before. Isn't that great? I love it. <laughs> until we get and, to the main event, you know. Yeah, until we get to the main event. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, man, that freaking uh, running Hurricane Rana over the ropes to the apron, taking uh, Cavanadio down, that was in insane. Yeah, the, I was going to bring that spot up and the splash, too. And what's so impressive about Cavanario's splash to the outside is that Dorada is on the complete, almost on the other side of the ring on the outside. And just the distance he covers, I think, is just what amazes me. Uh, yeah. Not to, I mean, the impact looks great, too, but just the whole thing beginning to end is just a really sweet spot. And the height that Dorada gets on everything is crazy. Just Yeah. I mean, he busted out ACH's little springboard uh, off the middle rope uh, tope con hilo, which is was, was very cool, too. Um, and, and then speaking of that, Dorada and ACH is a match that needs to happen somewhere in the world. Uh, where it's recorded. Uh, <laughs> That'd be awesome. I, I completely agree. Uh, so, next match, Bobby Fish takes on Beretta. I thought this was a fine match, too. Uh, Bobby Fish, I think, is just a terrific singles wrestler as well as a uh, tag team wrestler, as we see him most often in Red Dragon, of course. But I think him and Christopher Daniels have drank from the same well that is the Fountain of Youth in wrestling, because these guys... Continue to get older and continue to get better. Oh, I agree. Um, this was actually really good. I like the way that Beretta was just selling for this. Um, he really made it a big deal, you know, the whole uh, the leg and um, the just. I thought these two worked really well with each other. Um, just I, I've been a big fan of Beretta through this whole tournament. I thought he's been one of the shining points of it. I mean, not that really anybody had a bad tournament, but I thought Beretta did a lot for himself here. And the crowd obviously responds to him a lot more now because of that. So, um, you know, props to him. And I'm, I'm glad he's getting another shot and getting to make the most of it. Yeah, definitely. You know what? I just, like I told you guys before, I hadn't had a chance to watch New Japan uh, in a little while, actually, sadly. 
And so immediately I saw Beretta and I had to call Crime Stoppers because I had not found him until now. I was always, where's Trent? Where is Trent? <laughs> uh, but I finally found him. He's a New Japan people and he's doing a good job. I, I was not just overly impressed with this. I mean, I thought it was good. I, I think I felt like a little let down. I thought they were, these guys were really going to blow me out of the water. I really felt like that. Because Beretta's got so much talent, and and Bobby Fish is, you know, he's Bobby Fish. He does a great job usually, and I I think it was a decent match, but I just kind of let down uh, on this because I thought it was going to be better. I think that they did a great job telling a story, though, for me personally, um, just because of the way that they handled themselves, the way Beretta was, you know, getting a little frustrated at times that he wasn't able to put Bobby Fish away, uh, and Bobby Fish, of course, you know, handling business when he needed to. And the other thing is, it's so interesting to watch these matches, even with American wrestlers teaming up against each other. Uh, only because, the reason I say that is because they use the Japanese language too. Apparently, I saw Herb Beretta say something to the effect of "mother f- something." I couldn't understand that translation, um, but anyway. Beretta says a bunch of stuff in just English. Like I, <laughs> I think the one that I, I talked about with you guys, he was. He was yelling at Taguchi in English, like, you are not hitting me with that ass, man. Like, just, yeah. you're not doing it. You know, it's great. See, see that joke? That joke just flew over everybody. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. he John just <laughs> murdered that joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah Rocky that was does a... say stuff in Japanese, though. Yes. That's uh, what but no, that, it was so funny because, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting to be able to see, you know, these guys yell whatever they want because we're Americans, we know what he's saying, but in Japan, they're like, huh? Okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm sure if they have enough exposure, they know the naughty words. That's usually the first ones everybody learns in another language. Mm, not, yeah, you're right. Like uh, Bobby just calls everybody idiot the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, Bobby Fish does get the win here with a heel hook after getting out of the dude buster. Um, but uh, once again, another uh, a fine match, which is followed up by another fun match: uh, Rocky Romero and Nick Jackson going one on one. Uh, I thought this was fun. They tease a lot of stuff uh, throughout, like the tombstone uh, that Jackson wanted to do to Romero from jumping to the apron to the outside. I kind of wanted to happen, but then I'm glad it didn't happen because I think we might have seen somebody die. So, <laughs> yeah. definite bonus there. I love the uh, super kick from Nick when uh, Rocky does the Spider-Man. Normally the guy will just fall over over the ropes. This time Nick was like, okay, I've seen this before. Bam. <laughs> so it's good continuity. Cause like I said, these two just did have a match in the tournament of four. So, um, I, I really enjoyed it. They were, they always have a lot of comedy. It's funny. Uh, Rocky was wearing a mask for some reason instead of just wearing his pants. So Nick put the mask on and be, you know, threw the mask at him afterwards. And, um, I like the the finish too. Rocky just rolls him up out of nowhere, and Nick's like, "What? Come on, man!" Like, it's just so yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I mean, it it was really entertaining. Uh, when you know both these guys that are entertaining, they both come from awesome tag teams. Uh, you know, and once again, I mean, I get it; it's the gimmick, but man, it sometimes it kind of drives me at the wall. The whole suck it thing. It's just so much. It's like overwhelming. You know, That's especially the point. they want to annoy you. I know that, but it's just so much. And it's <laughs> Nick is like suck it. His high voice. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. It's not just suck it. It's like suck it. Like <laughs> I'm thinking, man, that I, I remember that when I was 13. You know, that's the way I sounded too. <laughs> and Triple H um, <laughs> certainly didn't sound like that. <laughs> no, but that's the way I sounded when I was trying to copy Triple H. Suck <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, but you know, I, overall. Good stuff. I mean, you know with Rocky Romero involved, it's going to be a pretty good match. And, of course, Nick does his his stick. And you know what? It's fun. It's entertaining. And that's why we love him. That's right. Uh, And as Sean said, Romero does get the win here with a roll-up sort of out of nowhere. Uh, We hit intermission after that, and we start talking G1 in there. Um, So... It's gonna the sh- the whole tournament's gonna last almost a month, which is just ridiculous. It's 19 shows long. It's the longest in G1 history. Um, they announced the participants, but no block placement yet. That's gonna come at Dominion. Um, so all the usual suspects are there. I can go through the list uh, real fast. It's AJ Styles. It's Bad Luck Fale, Doc Gallo, Soroki Goto, uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi, Hiroshi Tenzin, 
Carl Anderson, Katsuri Shibata, Kazuchika Okada, Kota Ibushi, The Surprise, Michael Elgin, Satoshi Kojima, Shinsuke Nakamura, Tatsuya Naito, Togi Makabe, Tomaki Hanma, Tomohiro Ishii, Toriyanu, Yuji Nagata, Yuji, Yujihiro Takahashi. There we go. Um, lots of names. Uh, pretty much everybody under the sun who matters in New Japan as far as mid-card to top of the card goes. Um, but I guess early early pick on a winner, and what do you think about Elgin? Uh, apparently it's Elgin's dream that he's been yelling about for to be in this for a long time. So, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it because if anybody's going to fit with that style, it's Elgin. Uh, a lot of the matches that he can have are going to be tremendous, I think. Um, I know people are wanting Roderick Strong really bad. I know I talked about it, but I think it's more of a booking problem because he's got so many freaking things that he's in. He's a freelancer, basically, and I think he was full impact pro champion at one point. I don't know if he's a champion anymore, and now and now he's like he's like the PWG champion right now, right? He is the PWG champion, former yeah, so, FIP champion. The the FIP champion right now is Rich Swan. Ah, so it's like he's he's probably got a lot of stuff going on, and he probably can't dedicate that much time to you know have, being there for the G1. Whereas Michael Elgin's not really doing anything in ROH right now, so mm. why not? You know, um, I know there's a lot of people who don't like Elgin, but you can put his whatever you feel about his character aside in ROH, I think that that's not going to matter here. It's about having good matches, and I think he can do that. And, oh, you know what's so weird is, like, isn't it, even, isn't if you win, you get a shot at the champion at uh, uh, whatever the, the Wrestle Kingdom? Yeah, you get the heavyweight title match at Wrestle Kingdom if you win G1. So why is the champion in this? Because, well, one, it might not be AJ Styles because we still have Dominion to go through. But if uh, the champion does win, then we get to figure out a challenger through a different way. Has that ever happened? It has happened. Ah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Nakamura, maybe? I'll just say Nakamura about that. Right on. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and mention my thoughts on uh, Elegant. I, I think Elegant is a great fit here. Like Sean said, he, he's a guy that can really come in and make an impact. I would look forward to seeing most of the matches that he'd be involved in. I mean, uh, the guy's just a great talent. He's one of ROH's best talents, and I think that he can you know give a lot of uh, effort here and a lot of great matches. So, I mean, I, I think it's perfect. And I'm, if it's his dream, man, I'm so happy for him because – it's super special when you get a chance to do something you've always wanted to do, and I hope he does great in it. Hopefully he gets far. Uh, as far as um, changing some things, I, can we just get rid of Fall A and maybe put even a young guy like Cody Hall in or maybe Gata? Is Gata in, in anywhere on that list? Gato? Gato, excuse me. He's not. Uh, he's a junior heavyweight, technically. See, man. Golly. But I just I just fall a why anyway. See, Japan sticks to the divisions, Gary. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm too Americanized. I'm trying to get very different. Um, anyway, my point being here is I just I fall he's not my favorite. Hopefully he'll be out early. He's not gonna win. Don't worry about it. Well, I don't worry about him winning. I'm just worried <laughs> about him winning a match to go on in the tourney. Well, um, it, it's round robin, so you will see yeah. him wrestle. Oh on lord. Show. I yeah, see, that. like, they're, the blocks are set up in a certain way where you have to wrestle everybody in your block, and then it's basically based on points. Whoever whoever has a certain number of points, you're going to go through, and then uh, how many go through to the... In, in recent next? history, it's been the top two. The winner of each block faces off in the finals on the last night. Okay. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. A while ago, I think uh, even as far back as maybe 2010... Uh, nope, I'm wrong there. 2009 was the last time they had semifinals where they took the top two uh, from each and then put them in a four-way bracket, and then the winners moved on to the final. Yeah, see, because they changed that for the Super Juniors this year, where last year they had the semifinals, too, and right. last year they didn't. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so but the, you know, we had the round robin here on the Super Juniors, and so we get a chance to see that again in G1. So, uh, I, as, a, as a winner, I'm going to go with my boy Naito. I'm just going to say they've given him a lot of exposure lately. 
Lots of exposure. You never know. Other people are looking at him. It's time to give him a shot. Um, he has won the four. Yes, he won uh, two years ago, 2013. And he, to, he needs to win again. It's time. He's waiting too long. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, and um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I, I just think the Naito is my boy. Uh, as far as Elgin goes, there are a lot of dream matches here, I think. Him and Goto, uh, him and Kojima, I think would be really good. Uh, re- him and Ibushi, I think, would put on a fantastic match, too. Just just guys we haven't seen him wrestle from the ROH cross-promotion ROH cross shows, too. Oh, Hanma. Hanma and Elgin would be oh, awesome, God. too. Him and uh, Ishii and Makabe would be a slugfest. Literally. Just who will live through the forearms is the question. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm a big Elgin fan. He's been different, I think, since the whole blow-up thing uh, a couple years ago when he lost the belt and all that stuff as far as in-ring style goes. Uh, so hopefully he'll let loose and put put on some performances here that will get everybody back on his side of the fence because he's a great worker. As far as a winner goes, I'm with Sean. It, I think it's Nakamura's year. I would really love to see Nakamura and Okada headline uh, the Dome. I, they haven't done that in a while. Um, and, and I don't... I don't know if Okada's going to win the belt back at Dominion or not yet, but I certainly wouldn't be opposed to that. You don't think they'll do the uh, AJ Nakamura dream match everybody keeps talking about? I don't know if they have enough faith in AJ yet to let him headline the Dome. Uh, hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if we get AJ and Nakamura in the final, though. That, G1. It, that could be possible. I, I, if I had to pick somebody else, I would love to see an Ibushi Nakamura rematch in the G1 final, to be honest. Oh, that'd be great. Because uh, I think Ibushi is a dark horse, sort of, to, to go go far, if not win. Um, just because they, they love him. New Japan loves him, some Kota Ibushi. And so does Japan, honestly. <laughs> well, especially because he brings in the, the girls. So. He brings in the ladies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cameramen love those, you know. Those so, ladies. like, okay, um, you know, Paul and I are part of this um, this uh, Japanese wrestling group or whatever, and they had a uh, Milano Collection AT as uh, one, the the guest commentator at ringside, and he's a previous winner of the Super Juniors. I mentioned I've only seen him in like one match or whatever. You were talking about like. That he he could do, do no wrong for you, for people who maybe saw this, saw him there, have no idea who he is. What do you uh, like? You know, let's say Gary has no idea who he is, but yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Milano Collection AT was uh, a junior heavyweight in New Japan who wasn't really finding some traction. Uh, for, uh, originally, he was out on the Indies. He used to wrestle for Big Japan and uh, a couple other promotions around Japan. He did a tour around uh, America and Mexico, which is, is very common uh, for Japanese wrestlers. And he came back. New Japan signs him. His entire gimmick was the fact that he was an Italian fashionista. Uh, and it was just, it was magic. Like, <laughs> I, I, it's it's so funny. Because he'd come in, you know, wearing Prada and talking about Gucci and Lord knows whatever else. <laughs> but the dude was just like a five-star wrestler, too. He was so talented. Uh, really, I... I want to say he won a climax, but I don't think that's right. Um, anyway, he, he had some success until uh, injuries ha- made him retire, unfortunately, because the, the guy would have gone very far. Uh, and, and might actually be one of the pillars of the junior heavyweight division right now if uh, if injuries hadn't kept him out of wrestling. No, yeah, because he's only 38. Yeah. Wow. Dude, dude was a beast, and just the injuries caught up with him, unfortunately. That's uh, Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna. You could really like YouTube any of his matches from anywhere. They're usually good to amazing. I I never saw him have a bad match. There you go, Gary. Yeah, I need to go check him out. Yeah, he sounds like a cool guy, you know. And I, I think it's interesting because you know the way that Japan works, they they give a lot of these guys you know an opportunity uh, no matter what and. You know, I, I don't think they, you know, of course, in American promotions, you get a lot of politics. And I'm sure in Japan there are some, uh, but it just seems like a lot of people get, you know, chances. And, you know, from what you're telling me about this guy's gimmick, I mean, I just feel bad for Rico because he could have done a lot of things over there. Oh, he put Rico to shame, man. Did he really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was man. Great. I got to I got to check this guy out. It's YouTube tonight. Uh, so <laughs> we come back from intermission with six-man tag team action. 
Uh, Hiroshi Tenzin, Satoshi Kojima, and Hanma team up to take on Yuji Nagata, Manubu Nakanashi, and David Finley, uh, who also went 0-7 in the best of the Super Juniors. Um, I think he looked like... He has like about a quarter of the toughness of his dad, and that's still a lot, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I still think he looked fine in this match. I thought this match was fine. Um, you know, Tenkoji doing the 3D to everybody was cool and all. Um, Hama winning, or H Hama getting the win is always going to be great for me. I'm never going to complain about a top rope Kokeshi getting the win. Yeah, I mean, uh, this whole thing, it was fine. Um, it was okay. You know, I, I just, there's not too much to write home about, if you ask me personally. Just for me, I think it was entertaining for what it was. But uh, to me, I think they left this match here simply that way that people would get back from their seats, going to the bathroom. They'd be okay. You know, oh, I didn't miss much. Because <laughs> I really didn't feel like I, I, I just, I, I honestly kind of felt like, you know, if, you, if I would have fast forwarded to the end, I would have got, you know, okay. Just didn't do anything for me. Yeah, yeah right? see, we we did talk about that. They they still do have like cooldown match matches and stuff like that. Like yeah, even after the intermission, it's still cooling down. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, I mean it's fairly forgettable. But uh, four of these guys are not young. Well, I should yeah, five of these guys are not young. Uh, Hanma is just lucky that he has the crowd behind him right now, and, and Nagata is a fan favorite for for forever, and so is Kojima, mm -hmm. uh, and Tenzin for that matter. Even though I don't like tens and all that much <laughs> yeah uh so we move on from there tag team action kazuchiko okada teams up with ghetto to take on yujiro takahashi and cody hall at the bullet club i imagine we'll be getting a lot of these in the run-up to dominion as okada is challenging styles at uh july 5th for the championship at dominion but i thought this was fine i think cody hall's get progressing along nicely takahashi had a new uh bullet club babe with him which is also you know that's that's a bonus um, Good lord! Yeah, who was pretty much wearing almost nothing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okada puts Cody Hall away with a brutal rainmaker, and just get, uh, it was awesome. Yeah, Cody Hall got <laughs> he made it rain. Let's just say that. Just... Paul sold the crap out of it too. Yeah. So that was a bonus. <laughs> yeah, Cody Hall had his moments. Um, th there was this one time where like. I felt like Ghetto was overselling, waiting for Cody to do something. He kind of just stood there. Um, other than that, uh, I thought that he was, again, protected well, put in the spots where he can look good. And, you know, it was kind of a there match. I expected Ghetto to do more, considering how much he had kind of had his moments in the tournament. Um, but, you know, it was pretty much a lot of Okada against... You know, either one of the two. Mm-hmm. Which I figured would happen as well, because, you know, Kata is a star. Uh, so you figured he'd get the hot tags, he'd be the guy that kind of showcased, and he was. Uh, Cody Hall, like Paul said, has progressed nicely, and I really am thrilled about that, just to see, you know, what he can do and um, how he's been learning and what he's been kind of, a, you know, been used with, uh, you know, of course, his moveset and all that. So I I'm thrilled about that. You know, the whole time I was watching the match, I kept thinking to myself, you know, in the future, you know, maybe four or five years down the road, we may see Cody Hall in a different place. And it would not shock me if he wasn't in a new legacy with Mr. Randy Orton. So, but I just think that they would actually be a good tag team. Just looking at him and looking at the way he, you know, does things, I think he'd be a good compliment to Randy Orton. Uh, but that is just me thinking while I was watching this match. But a great match uh, for what it was worth. We knew what level it was going to be. Um, but, you know, it was still entertaining. And Okada, once again, just wows us and we love him. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know if Cody Hall will ever find his way back over stateside anytime soon, but it's, it would be interesting. Uh, he does have that build, and he has that style that I think WWE would just eat up with a spoon. Um, yeah, plus, you know, they love their second generation anything. That's mm -hmm. true. So. And one thing before we move on, just real quickly, uh, I, I just, I've heard pe people say it all the time, but uh, Okada's dropkick is probably one of the best in the business, and I wanted to ask you guys if you guys thought the same thing. Because once again, I mean, it's a simple dropkick, but it just seems like the guy just freezes in time, and just it's perfect every time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, other than jumping Jim Brunzel, I don't think I've ever seen uh, that beautiful a dropkick. 
because uh, Jim Brunzel threw like the best drop kick I've ever seen in wrestling. Period. Oh, I would agree with you on that one. Um, just, but o- Okada's is just like majestic in the way that he does it. Like, and he he doesn't like flip over like a lot of people. He gets to the point where it almost feels like it's going to be that, but it just. Like you said, Gary, he hangs in the air and just comes down, and it's like, I, I don't know how you can, I mean, to be fair, you know, I still think there, there's plenty of people, you know, Randy Orton's is, is pretty great, too, you know, just, there, there's quite a few that uh, I think can stack up, but I think Okada's is on a league of his own, aside from mm-hmm. what, you know, Paul said with Brunzel. For sure. Yep. The, uh, yeah, and, uh, I'm sure I could think of other drop kicks if I had time to, but if you've never heard of Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, one, wow, thanks for making me feel old, and two, <laughs> thanks for making people older than me feel even older, and three, go look them up on YouTube, because Jumpin' Jim Brunzel and the Killer Beast was a wonderful tag team. Mm-hmm. Oh, and of course, Hardcore Holly's drop kick. Oh, right. Oh, like man. Good guy. I feel like he just punched you in the mouth with his feet. Oof, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, both him and Okada always find a way to have a boot somewhere near or around your face. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True that. Definitely oh, adds. <laughs> Gary, if you want to see why I said I wanted to see more, get, it just I'll, I'll have to show you the, the match between Ghetto and, and Taguchi from the, the Best of Super Juniors earlier. Because mm-hmm. that's what makes Ghetto awesome. Just He takes being a heel up to, like, the max, you know, and just does all the cool stuff that old heels used to do. Oh, wow. And I'll does it in that. one match, and it's just like, oh, this is so awesome. No one else does this anymore, you know? It's just... Yeah. Yeah, I think I really like that. I, I, you know, in this match, you know, he didn't do a ton, but on the other hand, to me, he still impressed me. I still was very impressed by Ghetto. Yeah, I mean, he had his shoulder pretty heavily taped, too, so uh, Lord knows, I'm sure working this kind of schedule with how uh, not young he is, uh, yeah. didn't do him favors. <laughs> uh, so uh, we go to the co-main event, is 10-man tag team action, action, easy for me to say, uh, Chaos, uh, led by Shinsuke Nakamura, uh, teams with Tomohiro Ishii, Toriyanu, uh, Kazushi Sakuraba, and Yoshihashi to take on everybody else who they have a feud with. So that's Tanahashi, <laughs> no, Togi Makabe, Katsuri Shibata, and Captain New Japan, who still exists to take pinfalls, and that's what he does. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it was, a, it was a fine match. Everybody who has beef with each other gets their hands on each other. Uh, the crowd loved it. It was fun. Nothing overly special, though. This is every multi-man New Japan match you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Seen them once, seen them all. It's, it's what it is, except for these guys have feuds with each other, so I, you know, there's a little bit more intrigue there. Yeah, exactly. You know, me and Sean, I had not got a chance to watch the show yet, and uh, I was texting Sean, telling him, letting him know I was getting to watch it, and he goes, "Yeah, if you get a little behind, if for you know, you don't get a chance to watch a match, this is the match you don't want to really watch." And I'm, okay. <laughs> Because I've already seen it a hundred times if I've watched New Japan, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, but here's the thing: um, I will say this, you know, Captain uh, New Japan. I, I feel a little bit bad for him. I know this is his job, and he takes the pinfall, and that maybe he he probably finds a lot of uh, I don't know, I don't know, maybe pride in it, just because you know he's always the guy that does it, or maybe he's helping people. I just feel bad for him because, you know, whenever he's talking to somebody about what he does for a living, it's, you know, I'm, oh, I'm on my back for a living, you know, so, and everybody probably thinks he's a porn star, but, you know. Uh, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you got a bad respect for him. That's really cool for a guy to do that and to take all the pinfalls and be cool about it. I, I, Captain New Japan, New Japan is cool. He's a great superhero. I like him a lot. I just had to throw that joke in there. A superhero that loses all the time. <laughs> I know, but still, he's always on his back every match. Uh, I mean, every year come G1 Tag Grand Prix, he's uh, he's the one tagging with Tanahashi, so. That's just for Tanahashi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What talking with? Okay. <laughs> I will say I'll never get tired of getting to see uh, a reunion of Goto and Shibata tagging for a little bit. So. Mm-hmm. 
It could happen. But now it, it's time to talk about this uh, absolutely over the top, stellar, crazy awesome, every other adjective I could throw at this to make it sound even more epic main event. Uh, it's, the, it's the best of the Super Junior finale. Kyle O'Reilly taking on Kushida. I, uh, yeah, it, it was everything I think I wanted to be in more. They, they work each other's arms because they both have submissions. They're throwing crazy amount of suplexes. I'm pretty sure they both died at least five times in the ring. It was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Just, <clears throat> I love the fact that there was build, build, and more build to it. It wasn't just, just constantly doing stuff just to be doing it. It all had a purpose. You know, they started slow. It kept, you know, they kept doing different things. You know, Paul said they, they both use arm submissions so there it's in, very interesting to see two guys with a sort of similar submission both have their own way of working the arm and then they also get to take each other's way of working the arm the whole like Kushida loves to do that whole grab your arm above your head and then slam it against the rope and and then you know O'Reilly does it to him and it's it's cool and I, I just I, I really enjoy this. It's just so good. And then you add in the story of Kushida like coming so close last year and then this year he he gets there. And then you could also say that like Kyle O'Reilly was probably the best wrestler in the entire tournament and he doesn't win. So, you know, you have to wonder if he's gonna get a similar story next year. But um just from beginning to end, fantastic stuff. And, you know, it's it's funny to me, like, people lavish so much praise on it, but, like, every review I see, no one wants to give it, like, five stars. So, like, to me, what, what makes a five-star match for you if it doesn't get to that, you know? I just don't understand how you couldn't give it five stars. I really can't. I mean... Uh, like Sean, like you're saying, what does really equal a five star match? Then I mean, I don't understand that. This is one of the best matches I've seen all year long, and we've seen some good matches. We really have. We've covered every promotion pretty much that's major promotion wise, and this one just thoroughly impressed me. I mean, the entire time I, I thought, okay, you know, it starts out good. I was waiting and waiting for them to start slowing down for it to kind of putter here and there. And not be the kind of match that it ended up being. I really did, but it man, it was uh, progressively good. Uh, both these guys, used, like you said, submissions. They used all sorts of um, unique offense, and I just thought, man, these two guys were giving their all, and they really did. And Kyle O'Reilly, I'm telling you, the guy it, is a lot better than I ever thought. Uh, I, I watched him here and there, watched him ROH. Yeah, great. He does some good matches. So he not long ago had a really good match. Um, but you know, with Jay Lethal and, and in that match, I thought was, he's really good, but you know, nothing just overly top. This guy wowed me in this match. And so I have a lot more respect for him. I knew Koshida was good and I've, I've really enjoyed watching Koshida, but man, I, I, both these guys, uh, just went up a notch in my book after this match. See why I said when we did ROH that we're spoiled with Koshida matches. That's, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's surely. Yeah, I mean, th this is the best singles match I've seen from both guys. And this is probably Kushida's best match of his entire career. I would say Kyle O'Reilly still has his best work with, against the Young Bucks, uh, teaming with uh, Bobby Fish, personally. But uh, as far as singles matches goes, this is definitely, this blows everything else uh, out of the water I've ever seen from Kyle O'Reilly as far as singles goes. Uh, Kushida, the right man to win the tournament. Definitely, I think, the right man to lift the championship off of Omega come uh, Dominion. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how you don't put the entire division on Kushida's back now and let him carry it. Because uh, this certainly shows what he's capable of as far as a big stage. And I think what you're probably going to be in store of for the next five to eight years as far as junior heavyweight wrestling in New Japan. I mean, he, he, I mean, he has the crowd. He has the, you know, he obviously, you know, has the wrestling ability. He has everything. He has... You know, even if you, I don't know if they'll take the time splitter thing away from him or or he gets to keep that and Alex Shelley loses it or, 
whatever. I, I don't know, but he uh, to me he has that all of that in one package, and you know I I think you've had Omega beat everybody else, but you know he's not faced Kushida, and I think you know for him to to be able to okay I, I he beat Omega now he's the guy that that carries it forward, and I think uh, this is. This is like tailor made for him. It's it's really great that he's going to be able to get to do this. Hopefully, yeah, definitely. You know, Koshida to me is the perfect guy to lead the division. I mean, just from my experience with him. I mean, this is you know just me talking, um, but just from what I have seen of him, I think he's a great guy, uh, great talent, and definitely someone to leave this division. Uh, you know, with and I, I just look forward to seeing what he could do. I sure hope the time splitters is not a thing of the past. Hopefully, they continue that. Um, I know he's got a lot more focus on you know singles probably now, but I, I just don't want to get rid of that. I, the time splitters are so great. <laughs> it's just me. I personally, I love the time splitters. So we'll have to see what they do. I just don't want him to lose the jacket. You know. Oh no, he can't. That's another thing. Uh, that's what makes me fearful too. The jacket would be terrible to lose. Well, that's your show. Uh, I definitely a match of your candidate uh, in the main event. Well, you know, what, what, I mean, we rated all the other pay per views. So, what were, where are we going to rate this one? I mean, I'll, I'll give it an eight personally. Uh, nothing awful. There's some. There's a few boring matches here and there, but I think the main event more than makes up for everything else you watch during the show. Oh, totally agree. Um, eight is where I was going to put it. Uh, if there's one match that everybody else has said already uh one match you need to see obviously the main event uh i would probably say if you like some lucha go watch the dorada and cabinario match because you can't go wrong there you know that there's there's some fun stuff in here uh, but uh you know just just fantastic that main event so that that makes this entire show worth it i definitely and i think you guys hit the perfect rating here eight is a great number uh it was a good show overall it really was and the main event just blows you out of the way of water and i think that man and that may be worth four points by itself um the rest of the show though it's got some great stuff you you really get a, a variety in this show and new japan does a great job with that i love that about new japan you always get variety you know you'll get your tag teams you'll get your six man tags uh heck you'll get your ten tag you know team so uh, i think it's really really interesting uh way to do it and i think the variety definitely makes it go up so eight's eight's a good number so um well it is time for us to move on so we will head out of here and i think we're going to touch on a few news topics before we hop on out so why don't we go ahead and jump into a few quick hits guys Oh, I don't have the thing. Ah, don't worry about it. This is a this is a extra anyway, so we don't need that music. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk some you know interesting news, and and this is one thing that I think was interesting, and Sean kind of brought this to my attention, so we kind of discussed this a little bit off air. Uh, but apparently, um, we know that it, you know, we have some tryouts at WB happening. We've got a lot of names that I think a lot of people know. One of those names that was Havoc, and she's been working and trying to get you know. It may be a roster spot with NXT um, and the WB trying to get a contract somehow, some way. And as she's been on her journey doing this, someone in the fandom or the world of the IWC uh, found some old text messages of hers when she was like 18 years old. Or Twitter. Or Twitter. Was it Twitter? Yeah, I, I, it's Twitter. Okay. Right, dude. Twitter. And, uh, yeah, so apparently in these tweets that she was sending out, she made a joke, a certain joke about KFC and being a list. I'm just going to say in that begins what the word is. Um, she also she says she hated Kofi a lot because he was an in, mm -hmm. you know. So with these things being said, even if they were jokes and get, I'll, I'll say I'm not, you know, I, I'm one of those people that I make a joke, but I'll make sure it's not, um, it's not a joke that maybe will offend somebody. I would never say a joke that out, out of context, I would never say a joke on a podcast that I didn't feel like it was going to really, really hurt somebody. And these kind of things are social media. That's out to everybody that hurts somebody. Now, if you're in your personal friends, you're in your personal house or something, you know, do what you're going to do. 
But with her doing this, who's at fault? Is the, is the fan who found these tweets and basically kind of making her look bad the wrong, or is she in the wrong, even though this is a long time ago? Yeah, I mean, the Twitter, the, I think it's from like 2008 is when the tweet was. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Obviously, you shouldn't be talking like this at, at all, anywhere. I don't care what the what the platform is, whether it's real life, internet, phone, wh- whatever you're doing. Just don't use the word. It's offensive. It has a terrible history here in America. Just don't use it. Um, and, I mean, it is partially on the fan. Who goes back through four or five years of tweets just to look for this one thing and retweets it today? Just, I... It seems vindictive yeah. to me. So, I'm looking at the tweet because uh, I had we had a somebody that doesn't post in our group that much, but he is uh, black. He posted a picture of the tweet. It's from August 14, 2011, and it says at KFC right now, channeling my inner N-word. Um, I've all, like I said, I've also seen other ones where she says something about Kofi Kingston and, and whatever, and she sent out this long-ass apology, and it is whatever it is. Uh, you can, you can say that you were 18 and doing dumb stuff, and I understand that you can be dumb at 18 and say dumb things, but why would you not go and delete? these tweets like why would you you have to i mean unless you were just pissed drunk or high or i don't know like what why would you not remember hey i i probably should go through my twitter before i go to this tryout because you know wb really looks at that now and i mean to be fair to her i guess she probably didn't think somebody would be mean and find uh, all these tweets and retweet them or whatever, but I, I have to agree with uh, Paul. Like, I, I think I was telling Gary, there are plenty of people that don't like her for whatever reason. Um, you know, and, and I can understand, you have a right to not like whoever you want, but when you're messing with somebody's real life and you're taking it out of wrestling, that's, that's two different things. You know? Mm-hmm. So... I, I just think you have to be careful sometimes when you're messing with somebody's life because she's uh, the girlfriend of Solomon Crow. So I'm sure it would have benefited both of them if you know she's working in the same company as him and they don't. She doesn't have to be going around the Indies and whatever, and they can see each other more often. And it would be great for WWE. Like it's been a long time since they had, you know, since China basically to have the big Amazon woman. You know, so, I mean, it's it's a, a concept in wrestling that has worked, especially for a woman's division, like, to be able to have all these great women in there and then have somebody as big as Havoc who can actually work, even though we didn't see it in TNA. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see how that works out, and maybe we won't get to now because all this is blowing up, and... The way WWE usually reacts to Twitter, usually this is not going to end up, a, a, you know, good for her. Yeah, it, this is just, you know, like you guys said, it's sad in a way because, you know, she's trying to get her uh, career moved on and trying to, to reach new levels. And for someone to try, you know, try to hurt her, it, it's not good. Yeah, sure. She was in the wrong what she did. She really was. And. You know, when you use those kind of words, those very, very hurtful words, and you try to hurt people, uh, or not try, even if it's an accident, it's still hurtful. And so she should have known better. And she, of course, should have took responsibility for that. And, hey, maybe even deleted that account if she knew she had stuff like that on there. I mean, you've got to know that you did that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm always very, very mindful, me personally, of what I put on Facebook uh, or even on Twitter. I have a Twitter account attached to my Facebook. And, you know, I, I try not to say anything that would hurt somebody. I'll make jokes. I, I'm not, you know, afraid of doing that. And I'll say things. Um, but, you know, I'm very careful in what I say. And I would never use those kind of words, um, especially for the fact that I am good friends with a lot of people who are hurt by that word. And even if I'm not friends with it, it don't matter. 
but I just know for a fact that that's not the kind of person I want to be personally. So, um, right, I mean, but there's a difference between what you do publicly in a public forum and what you do when you're at home. You know, mm-hmm. well. Um, you know, you, you say that, Sean, and I agree. Here's the thing, and this is just for me personally. Uh, back when I was maybe two or three years into my college, um, I, this is, my, of course, my uh, community college time, or probably my second year in community college. I had a young man uh, that was African-American, and he lived with me for an entire summer, and we were the best of friends, hang out every day, do everything together. Um, and it was really cool and, and we'd make jokes and, and let's be honest, those jokes came up, but it was a different side of the story because me and him understood there was no hurt there. Um, and he would make jokes with me, but I I don't feel regretful for that. I don't feel remorse because I, I believe in the context, it was at a time when I was younger and not only that, it was with someone that, Hey, you know, if anyone was gonna be hurt, it was him. And I respected him, and I still to this day respect the heck out of the guy. But I've grown up. I've learned a lot of things. And, you know, I don't think I would still do that to this day. I don't think I would do that with him just because I don't feel right about it now. Not as much as I did right. maybe back then. So, um, But you've got to give her credit because she was young. You can't, you can't hurt her now as an older adult. We've all done things in our youth that are very sketchy. Um, we don't want to be bringing yeah, those things. Yeah, there's people that have done way worse things in their youth. <laughs> mm-hmm. So and saying something on Twitter. Hopefully Havoc has learned a lesson here. Hopefully she gets a chance. Hopefully WB does not put this in front of everybody's face and say this is what's not to do. Sorry, Havoc. I hope they give her a chance because she could definitely be used. Uh, so, uh, well, let's talk about something else that's very interesting. And we didn't talk about this on our uh, regular show because it was we had a lot of people on and we didn't have a chance to get to it. But I want to bring briefly bring this up. This is another controversy. Uh, there was a couple of young men in the high school that were deciding that they wanted to use some wrestling moves at their graduation. One walked across the stage uh, with a WWE World Heavyweight Championship belt. And uh, he thought it would be fun to do, and he did it. But a friend of his was choreographed to come up and give him the Stone Cold Stunner. Uh, both these young men, uh, of course, had their diplomas withheld, uh, and they're currently, you know, waiting around for them. I'm sure. Uh, so, needless to say, what do you guys think about this? Because I think it's kind of funny. After all these years, these guys, you know, obviously were very little in the Attitude Era if they were just now graduating high school. Because, my God, the Attitude Era was when I was in high school. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting that they still think about Stone Cold Steve Austin. I would think they'd do the RKO because that's more popular now, right now. But uh, needless to say, do you think these kids did the wrong thing? Do you think the school is being too hard on them? What's your thoughts? Uh, I, I also found this hilarious. Um, like most wrestling, doing wrestling moves in public places, I, I usually laugh at. Uh I it's you I think you just have to pick your time though. Obviously high school graduation is taken very seriously for a lot of people, especially the school. Uh so maybe you don't do that here. Maybe you do it in the parking lot or on the field or in the grass outside whenever everybody's out there taking pictures. Maybe not while you're doing the procession. <laughs> <laughs> My you know, as someone that I did the uh Christian Captain Charisma put my hand in front of my face looking out at everybody thing when I came up. And they told us we weren't supposed to do any of that. You know, um, they wanted us to walk. And I went to a private Catholic school. Um, and they made a big deal about that they didn't want us doing any of that. Um, or they would do the same thing with all their diplomas and whatever. And that really went out the window when before we before selfies existed... Um, somebody came up with a, one of the, you know, disposable cameras and did a selfie with the principal and he still got his diploma. So, but I just think that it's one thing to, you know, do a little taunt or, you know, if he, no, I'm not, obviously I want to be doing the middle finger or whatever, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's a different thing to enact violence on a stage that you have all these people watching you, all these families, you know, kids. Uh, it's just not the smartest place to do that. 
it's probably really embarrassing for the school. Um, and to your point, Gary, the they wouldn't do the RKO because that would involve him actually slamming the other guy into the floor, um, which that would really hurt and could, you know. Oh, well, you got to practice stun, The stunner, you're bouncing, you know, yeah, as long as you do it right, the other guy is barely hitting the floor at all, so. Yeah, I, I think you could do the RKO safe. You know, you land on the guy's shoulder, you don't. Yeah, I want to see him do the RKO and then he misjudges and the guy falls off the stage. <laughs> too, that's that's what's going to wind up happening. It's just... Well, I'm just saying, all the memes out there and all the RKO stuff that's been going on lately, I figured that'd be more popular. Um, yeah, you would think that, right? Yeah, but I mean, I think, it's, hey, Stone Cold Steve Austin's probably sitting very proud that Kids even these days still know who he well, is. Well, I mean, I'm sure that they watched his podcast and they said, "Oh, who's Stone Cold? Let me go watch." And mm-hmm. you know, well, then the, the power. At least of nobody the tried to do a springboard stunner, you know. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Use the teacher for the springboard, huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it's just you know, uh, I think you know, kind of a funny. Thing that happened, and yeah, hopefully these kids get their diplomas. They deserve them, man. They worked hard. Sure, they did I'm a little. Sure, stunt. they will. It's just the school. Mm-hmm. They're embarrassed, and they want to prove a point. Yeah. I just, I wish they would have had a third party. I wish they'd had another student stand up and go, "Oh my God, Stunner!" <laughs> 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 That'd been perfect. Take the and microphone then, from somewhere. And hey, Stone add a, Cole, Stone Cold. <laughs> add a fourth one. Puppies! Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, they're doing a commentary for 2K16 already. Yeah, isn't so. that cool? I'm so glad. A special Attitude Era. Of course, we've already had an Attitude Era with uh, 2013, but hopefully in 2016, they'll have some new stuff we haven't had a chance to watch. And uh, looking forward to Al Snow being a part of that, hopefully. They could technically do Attitude Era Part 2. Mm-hmm. But that's if, you know, they're willing to deal with half of that being in TNA, but... Uh, yeah, that's a thing, but you know what? TNA guys, I mean, they, they should be able to get that a chance, too. Hey, supposedly, you know, WWE has admitted that they're interested in TNA guys now. Isn't that so interesting? It really is, because they were so adamant about being a part of anything TNA. Uh, we're not going to take any of your talent, no matter what. Now, all of a sudden, they're interested in uh, some of the talent, and I'm like... Oh, Austin Aries' oh. contract ends at the end of this month. Yeah, man. I, I I would be so happy to see that, but I really want Bobby Roode. That is my number one draft pick. I think he's signed up for like at least another year or so. Yeah, sadly. But well, you who know. knows? TNA may not be around for them. <laughs> oh. It's true. Ah, so sad. So very sad. Anyway. Uh, well, we'll have to keep you guys updated on that news. Hopefully, we'll find out more information as it comes. Uh, but, you know, one last thing that we probably all talk about here is Destination America. Kind of staying on the TNA format here. We're going to talk about ROH, though. ROH is now part of Destination America. They made their debut not long ago. And we're going to get a chance to see what they can do. But Destination America has already, you know, kind of put some feelers out there and let ROH know that there might be a possibility that you guys can do two live events on our network. So that being said, it seems like Destin- Destination America is, you know, kind of excited about having ROH. Not only that, they want to give them a little bit more opportunity to shine. What do you guys think about this for them to allow ROH to have two live events? Uh, I think it shows that they have more faith in ROH than they do TNA. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be honest here. They're not paying a lot of money for that syndicated TV that they're getting. So right. these live specials are going to be the only thing that they're really paying for. So it's kind of okay. Yeah, and it makes sense. Destination America wants their own spe- uh, specialized content, I'm sure, too, out of this deal. And giving ROH an opportunity to have these specials, uh, whether to either just showcase what they have going on right now or whether they want to make them like mini pay-per-view shows or whatever they want to do. I think I, it works best for both, I think. So do we want to talk about the not-so-big golf and ratings between the two that that happened, if you add in the replays? Because yeah, let's talk about it. That didn't make TNA look good at all. They only beat RH by like 100,000 or something like that. Oof. And... You know, if you're trying to prove to the network that you're that 
great. And let's let's think about this too. Like Destination America doesn't promote. They didn't promote ROH at all. In fact, during ROH, there was stuff for TNA constantly. So, like, you would have thought that ROH is just this thing. So, to me, I think that, you know, it it proves that TNA really needs to get on the ball here. And they need to be blowing ROH out of the water, not barely beating them. Or it, it's not going to do them any favors right now. It's only going to make Destin America, America go, oh, well, we can afford to let them go. Yeah, I totally agree. It makes you a little bit nervous for TNA. Um, just because of the fact that these numbers do not make them look very good at all. And, of course, you know, you just pointed out Destin America is not paying that much for ROH at all. And they're sitting here with this big bill with TNA. Um, because TNA does cost more, and TNA apparently, you know, is not that much better uh, if you go by those numbers. It just makes me wonder how fast we're going to see panic mode hit with TNA, and how soon we're going to see Abyss choke slime Jesus. Oh God! I'm I want to see that before they die. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I mean, it's just Billy Corgan. He's going to have to put some overtime here to really help this company. So, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I think this is really, you know, a situation that... Uh, Let, let's also be fair. This was the first night of TNA on Wednesdays. Let's see what happens in a couple of weeks. If it doesn't move, then maybe we need to hit the panic mood. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, you know what? Here's another thing. Do you think that, the, you know... TNA is probably pretty sad that ROH has got guys like Samoa Joe and things like that. Well, of course, he's finishing out before he goes to WWE. But don't you think it's kind of sad that you know they're able to use him in those scenarios? And yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's a good thing for TNA now that WWE is kind of signed that full time thing with Samoa Joe, where Samoa Joe won't be on TV for ROH. But think if they did allow him, think how how sad that would be for Dixie to watch. <laughs> One of her biggest guys go down to ROH and just rock the house when didn't do a whole lot for and they did she he did some great stuff in TNA but it didn't do a whole lot to really build the brand like already is for ROH and WB I mean my God they can't keep his shirts in stock yeah I mean and in, the, what's even funnier is that this was a mediocre uh, episode of ROH TV versus a pretty good episode of Impact so. What happens when we start getting to the end of these uh, War of the World episodes and, uh, you know, we're getting the, the Okada main events and, and the bigger matches and TNA maybe doesn't have a great show that week. You know, let's let's see where the numbers draw there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that so. was the most interesting thing for me, too, was the fact that you kind of had a meh show and it still did that. And then who knows when we get these... <laughs> Like, you know, you start getting into the builds for the Best in the World show and all that. I mean, it's it's going to be interesting. Which, that's coming up pretty soon here, too. Yeah, it really is. So, we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, well, guys, I think it's pretty much, you know, everything we had for you guys. I'll, I'll say one last thing before we jump out of here. Uh, there will be a new show following Monday Night Raw. Um, it is called, I believe, uh, The List. Is that correct, Sean? I'm just trying to remember right here. Uh, the, 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 on the network, the, you mean? Yes, the WB List will follow Raw. And it's about wow. the Divas. Have you seen the commercials for it? I have not got a chance to check it out. Yeah, it's the- like, I think it's actually called Trending or whatever. It's it's like how the Divas always wind up being trending on Twitter and all this yeah, it's, I, I just don't know uh, how, how, how excited are you for it because I mean, it doesn't sound not like it, really. Much- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, like you know, this is not the kind of. I think overall they really haven't done. They're still doing a bunch of clip shows with these things. Like, it's cool to see um, Corey Graves go to these places, but it really doesn't do much for me. You know, and, like, Renee Young, like, okay, the interview with Seth Rollins was kind of cool, but it was really short. And then I really don't care about the fact that she uh, interviewed Wiz Khalifa. 
you know, and like the Too Hot for TV thing is still a clip show. It's just Jerry Springer getting to be the host for it. I mean, a lot of this stuff really isn't that inventive. And if you're at least if you're going to give us stuff, at least do more of those like there'd be 24 things or. If you're not going to find shows that are actually, you know, really worth something, then then do more of that. Because that's kind of like the only thing that they're really hitting on right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, these clip shows are great and all, but man, how many times can you see these same clips and doing some of these things like that? I, I don't know. I Like I said, I didn't get a chance to see this. Um, I mean, trailer. if you didn't watch the Attitude Era, I mean, great. To, to, you know... It's there for you for those kids that I will say this. It's a good way to get the newer fans to watch the older content, which apparently never gets watched by anyone and is why they don't make a big deal about putting older content up on the network, which really sucks because you really should have more Nitro episodes by now. We should have more episodes of pretty much all these old territory shows that, they just have in a collection sitting there somewhere. Apparently, all this stuff is digitized, but they won't put it on the network because nobody watches it. So they don't want to waste their time putting it on there, and then it's just sitting there, taking a bandwidth, I guess, or whatever. So it's just sucks. sad. Yeah, that's very, very sad. I wish they would rethink that. Um, but, you know, also their fault is for putting a lot of things out there and not putting, you know, a series. They just put one show out there from a certain yeah, time period. Exactly. You know? I mean, how no, a lot of context is missing. Mm-hmm. How, how excited can you be for a feud that you didn't get to build up before or something? So, it's the hopefully. same thing with the pay-per-views. Like, I keep saying that. Like, until you have the Raw that go, all the Raws that go with those pay-per-views, it loses a little bit of its luster, you know? Mm-hmm. I completely agree. Uh, but, you know, looking at this, Paul, you know, for this, you know, we're just talking about this show right here that's coming after Raw. I mean, I, I know the Divas division is kind of suffering right now, not a lot going here. Does this help any at all? I mean, I'm sure they'll be advertising the crap out of this show during Raw. Do you think this helps at all, or is this just a way for them just to put more Diva stuff out there? It's probably that one. I don't know if this is going to help them all. What they really, if they want to make the divas popular, they need to put effort in what they're doing with them. Very clearly, what they're doing right now is not effort. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is just the whole thing. I, I'm curious. I am. I'm really honestly am curious about the show. Probably won't watch it. If I watch it, it'll be five minutes probably. Uh, I'm I'm curious about the train wreck. It's not more about the good, how good it'll be. It's more about the the, the damage. So. Um, but you know, uh, hopefully WB comes out with better content. Hopefully we'll get a chance to see good stuff. They have some great stuff on there. Don't get me wrong. And it sounds like we're kind of talking bad about the network. We're really happy with it. I am. Uh, personally, I enjoy having well, it. I'm happy with it just because you get the pay reviews for ten dollars. I'm not uh, mm-hmm. you know, hating and, on that. And NXT always right there for you to go check out. So good stuff. The Don't get us wrong. Takeovers. All those. Mm-hmm. So, good stuff. So, anyway, well, okay, guys. Well, I think it's time for us to head out. This has been a very awesome special. We hope everybody enjoyed it. And like I said, if you're a new listener, never heard us before, or, hey, we have our special uh, show every week. It is on Thursday nights, early Friday morning. Uh, we were live around, you know, 12 a.m. Uh, most of the time, and you can come check us out. You can, we are on Spreaker.com live, so that's where you're going to find us, and you can come and chat with us. You can come and call us. Uh, we have a phone number to call in, so anytime you want to do it, you can give us a call. Go check out our Facebook page. We have a great Facebook page full of fans that love wrestling, love talking about it, and, of course, have a lot of content that they put on our page that, hey, if you haven't got a chance to read up some wrestling news, there's plenty of it for you on our page. And, of course, to meet some good friends. We've got a lot of great people on there. We just had a couple of guys last week that are great uh, guys on that page call in. Love talking to those guys. So, hey, we want more. We want you guys to come be a part of this whole thing. Uh, But anyway, well, Sean, why don't you give us a few things before we head out of here? Well, um, the first thing is that we are now part of the VOC Nation, along with, uh, you know, our good friends that we always talk about here. You know, Harry Broadhurst and Tony Acero and Jimmy Christopher on the Raw Reaction and Harry and Patrick, who always, they always join us for those uh, 
Dudley Pay Review specials um, on Wrestling Unwrapped. Uh, now we get to say that we're part of part of that whole uh, radio network. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can catch us. If you have access to the live feed, which I don't know how that works, uh, we are going to be Fridays at noon. And we're also available immediately on demand there. As soon as I put it up there, it's it's there for you to listen to. If you're a VOC Nation person and you want to listen that way, we're going to be there. Along with our other two podcasts, you know, me and Gary's other podcasts, and then the game, you know, uh, the Football to Football is also there. Um, that's going to air before W2M on Fridays at 9 a.m. And then Co-op Multi... The 4-1 video game podcast is going to air Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Uh, on that. And we're that's actually taking our old Tuesday night spot. Uh, Co-op Multi is now going to be on Tuesday nights. And we're doing our E3 predictions with the full cast. Randall's going to be on. Uh, Jeremy, everybody talking about E3. We'll let us getting ready for... What's well, going to be a hell of a week for me, because not only am I going to be doing live reaction podcasts with the, with the guys, i got to write news for all the stuff that's happening for E3. So, yay, but at least I get paid for that one, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of worth it, it's, you know. Um, we do this stuff for free, by the way. So, you know, we do this stuff just because, hey, we love wrestling, we know you love wrestling, so... Thank you for listening to us. Um, of course, if you you know you listen through whether it's four on one or Spreaker or or um, Last Word or Page Two or whatever, we are available on the man and like at iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn and Player FM and the Podbean app through Last Word Radio. Um, we are available in a lot of places. Uh, as I already mentioned, so check us out there and rate and review us on Stitcher and iTunes because that helps us be seen by more people. The more more times you review, I know it's a pain sometimes to go through iTunes and hit a hit five stars or four stars or whatever you feel like it deserves, or to write a couple lines about what you think about the podcast. I know it's a pain, but it would help us out a lot. So. Anybody that's listening that feels to take the, you know, five or ten minutes, we really appreciate it. That'd be awesome. And if you ever want to send us a question, you know, whether it's about what you heard here today about New Japan or or about anything, we have an email, wrestlingsthemax at gmail.com. You can send it there, or you can go join our Facebook group, the W2M Facebook group, because it's great. It's got some awesome people you can talk to. Um... And uh, we also have a Twitter. You can follow us on Twitter, at Wrestling2Max. I'm usually live-tweeting the pay-per-views or live-tweeting Raw. I'm now also live-tweeting some of the shows on Wednesdays. I'll at least have NXT on my computer and have either ROH or Lucha Underground on the TV. And we have the group is now kind of getting geared towards the Wrestling Wednesdays. So I'm calling it that because it's better than the Wednesday Night War that's on a war. <laughs> it's, it's not a war, people. I'm just saying. Uh, I agree, it's not. So, yeah, we definitely want you guys to know that we do talk about all the wrestling shows. We talk not only WB, NXT, of course, we jump into Lucha Underground, we talk TNA, we talk ROH. Uh, we talk about all the shows, really, and of course, New Japan is usually a special because we don't get a chance to watch all their dailies. Uh, the stuff they have every well, week. They so. don't. They don't have uh, <clears throat> stuff every week unless you live in Japan, and even then, it's yeah. Just basically, the house shows get put on TV. Yeah, so we we can't cover everything, but at least we get a chance to talk about the big things. So, um, but we're so glad you came and joined us this week, and for our regular show on Thursday, yeah, hey, it's a big one. You don't want to miss it. And we're we gonna cover be, a lot of we'll stuff. We'll have a special for Money in the Bank as well. We're gonna have yes, a, a Money in the Bank preview. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. We are. We're doing that preview on Thursday. Oh, so. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, we're looking forward to doing it. And we'll probably, you know, get a chance to do all the predictions there. And 
uh, all the other cool stuff we usually do on that show. So we're looking forward to it. Come join us. You won't uh, you won't forget us because uh, we'll definitely have some things in there that <laughs> you know, make you uh, probably laugh or cry. So anyway, guys, well, we love you. Uh, we hope to see you guys soon, and Thursday will be the day. Until then, if you're not living life to the max. Not living life at all. You know it. Please. Later.